All right, 27.2, the <coughs> excuse me, the Korean War and McCarthyism. Well, this is the second section of the Cold War chapter of the textbook, and I've subtitled this Contextual Contextualizing the Crazy, because it seems a little bit nuts that five years after World War II ended, the United States is in another war. And... Um, and in far off Asia, and why, why exactly? It also seems a little crazy that the country went, um, uh, well, euphemism for crazy, nuts. The country went a little nuts, um, seeing communists everywhere in the United States, seeing everyone as a possible um, communist trying to really destroy America. And where did it all come from? It just didn't just come out of the blue. Well, it came out of uh, the post-war period, but particularly 1948 um, and 1949 were really tricky years for the United States. <coughs> Excuse me again, and for the world. So I want to go over some of that stuff. Uh, that's why I've called it contextualizing the crazy. So. The Korean War and McCarthyism, I'm trying to really uh, describe why these two things were able to happen. I'm going to centre on 1949, uh, both overseas and at home in the United States, and try and, set up, try and give you an idea of why McCarthy came to uh, be a very important person in American politics in, in, in the US in 1950, and also why we were in um, so ready to jump into a war in Asia in 1950. So both of those things began in 1950. But in 1949, what it, it was a really rough year. I don't know if people in the United States in 1949 saw how rough it was, but I think they, without really seeing it, they they felt it, and they felt fear. And fear is really useful uh, for people who come along and exploit that. Anyway, not uh, conspiracy theories aside, if we look at the map of Europe, we've got all of this stuff. We know red is the colour of communism, so. All of these countries are now communist countries by 1949. Now, in the middle of the red, there is one little exception, and that is the city of Berlin, which was the capital of Germany. Now it's the capital of what's called East Germany. East Germany was a communist country. It was taken over by the USSR on their way um, through Europe in 1945. And then... The uh, Western powers, uh, which were going from the West uh, towards Berlin, they kind of met in Berlin. They took control of Berlin. And East Berlin was owned by uh, Soviet-supported uh, Soviet -supported government. And West Berlin, on the left-hand side, was supported by Britain, France, and the United States. And it was a really weird situation because you had East Germany, which was a communist country, West Germany, which is a democracy. But in the middle of communist East Germany, you had half of a city that was still democratically owned. And the United States and other Western powers helped to make sure that that happened. You may remember the Berlin airlift. Well... That's part of the story. So this is the kind of the first big showdown between the two superpowers, the USSR and the United States. And it's going to end up with the Soviet Union backing down. But it got a bit tense for a while. And during, this, during the Cold War, where neither the Soviet Union nor the United States actually meet each other on the battlefield, they're still going to get into it. Um... And 
as you know from yesterday, through proxy wars. Korea is one of those proxy wars. All right, so let's let's look at 1949, a rough year. So this is Berlin. This is the city of actually, sorry, this is uh, Germany. This is West Germany, and this is East Germany. This is Berlin here, and Berlin was divided into West Berlin, East Berlin, right? East Berlin was red, communist, and uh, West Berlin was democratic, and it was actually actually jointly owned by the British, and overseen, not owned by, overseen by the British, the French, and the United States. Stalin had well, four years after the uh, the world World War Two was over. He thought this is ridiculous. I've got these Western powers, the Western Bloc, occupying uh, a city, the main city, in communist-controlled East uh, East Germany, and it's it, this is stupid. They should they should just get out. So what he did was he blockaded. Berlin. So he put tanks all around Berlin, East and West Berlin. And he said, well, you know, I'm not going to do anything other than stop things coming in and going out. Now, there was uh, a train route that would, would, would go, would, that went this way towards West Germany. But the only other way in was by air, and he blocked the railroads. So they couldn't get out by rail, which is the way that a lot of raw materials came in. He blocked the roads. And um, so the only way in was by air. And President Truman decided he was not going to be bullied by Stalin into getting out of West Berlin. So what he did was, from these different airports, he delivered supplies, much of which came from the United States, um, to Berlin, and he actually flew the stuff in to Tempelhof uh, Airport in West Berlin, and just basically ignored the blockade, and he said, all right, Stalin, um, ball's in your court now, what are you going to do, are you going to fire on us with your tanks? Stalin did not want to get into it with the United States, and he just let the planes land and land and land with their supplies for the West Berliners. So the United States was keeping these guys going all through 1948 and 1949. So I guess you could say that this wasn't all bad. Um, the, the West Democratic West Berlin had remained democratic. But it was still, it was kind of a showdown between, between the East, dominated by the Soviet Union, and the West, dominated by the United States, the superpowers. Another rough thing about 1949, the, United, the USSR tested its first atomic bomb. How did it get the atomic bomb? Well, they, they had some people in the American government. That person you can hear in the background is, is Hazel. She's having a bath and saying whatever she's saying. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb. It got some of the secrets for the atomic bomb from some American scientists who were also spies. And this was part of the problem in 1949. Oh my gosh. Now, the United States is not the only person with, with atomic capability. Um, the USSR, a dangerous communist threat to the US um, and to the rest of the world as they saw it, um, now has the same capability. See this? See this? It's called a mushroom cloud. You can see why it's called a mushroom cloud. There's the stem, there's the head of the mushroom, and it has this wide kind of circular smoke explosion thing. This is classic. Every time you see this shape and this kind of, uh, it looks like clouds, doesn't it? Mushroom cloud, it's called. You know, it's a an atomic test or an atomic bomb or a nuclear test or a nuclear bomb. So, in 1949, another blow, another threat, um, another nation in Asia. Now, remember, uh, the USSR is in Asia and in Europe, right? 
Um, most of the people live on the European side of uh, the USSR uh, and Russia. But below Russia, you've got this place called China. In 1949, China became a communist nation under the leadership of Mao Zedong, who was this guy here. And he was a, another brutal dictator, in, you know, in the same vein as Stalin. And uh, so now you had another large country with lots and lots of people becoming communist. That was, that was, that was scary. So the, the communist influence was starting to spread. How easy was it going to be to contain it? Containment, of course, being the strategy for stopping uh, the spread of communism. Meanwhile, back in the States, 1949, we've got spies discovered in the U.S. This is Alger Hess. He was a State Department official. The State Department, by the way, is the department of the U.S. government that's responsible for anything to do with relationships with other countries and how to react or deal with other countries. Very, very important. I mean, it's the most important thing next to you know, running the country is deciding how we're going to deal with other countries. And of course, 1949 was a pretty tricky time in American, in the American State Department. And the idea that you had someone who might have been a communist, um, and he was in fact convicted, but not for being communist in in the State Department. He was convicted for lying under oath. Um, but. Alger Hess. Uh, the interesting thing about that is he was he was the main witness against him who said this guy have evidence this guy is a communist. He was a communist who was working for the State Department. His name was Whitaker Chambers, and uh, there were no charges against Whitaker Chambers because he'd helped to uh, uncover this guy. Now, unlike Whitaker Chambers, there was no actual evidence to suggest that this guy was a communist, that he was a spy or anything like that. And he maintained that until his death in 1996, I think he died. But in, but still, you know, on the face of it, you know, Americans are terrified. Oh my gosh, we've got communists working against us in the U.S. government. And um, not just in the U.S. government, but in weapons research, nuclear scientists, atomic scientists are also working for the communists and trying to undermine our American way of life. These guys were actually executed. Um, they were hanged um, in 1952, I think, uh, for, for betraying their country, for selling secrets to the Russians. And they absolutely did that. And I, I kind of like this photo because it shows them they're so kind of defiant, especially Ethel. Uh, so scientists selling... Secrets to the Russians. He got this guy suspected of being uh, uh, working for the government, but also, you know, working for the communists. And you've also got um, this thing called HUAC, um, which continues to root out communists in all four walks of life, from Hollywood to schools. Now. Really what HUAC is, the, the House Un-American Activities Committee, well, their main job is to figure out if there are people who are working for the other side. And uh, a lot of actors were accused of being communists. Um, colleges, people in colleges were accused of being communists, even people in schools. So it's quite interesting. Um, you had to take uh, an oath of loyalty to the United States to try and avoid being uh, losing your job for being un-American. In uh, that's it. All right. I was going to get into the Korean War, but I don't think I am. I think I'm going to just stop right there, and I'm going to let you read the textbook, which is going to be on this assignment too, and see what happened with the Korean War, um, 1949 being the, the year before the Korean War started. The other thing um, that I want you guys to take a look at is 
McCarthyism and Joseph McCarthy, who he was. Because really he was, he saw the writing on the wall, he saw what was going on. Uh, he was a senator from Wisconsin. And he made a lot of trouble for people, he said, were communists uh, in the US government. And he really had no evidence at all. He just had accusations. So read, the job today is to read the textbook um, about the Korean War and about Joseph McCarthy. And then we'll get into that in a bit more detail tomorrow.